Good morning, everyone. The slides ready? Well, Tom did a fantastic job, and uh, I think that uh, what's really important for you as investors is Tom Calandra is out there and going to all these countries. And today, it is so difficult to get investment people to go on these trips. In fact, it's one of the unexpected consequences of all the regulations in the investment world that when we travel as our group, we have systems and processes for our team to go into these uh, challenging areas and countries of the world. However, we don't see the fidelities of the world. We never see their analysts going to Colombia, going into uh, in a helicopter to look at operations. And this is a real key factor because great investing is both explicit knowledge, that is, what is the relative valuation and the tacit knowledge, visiting people, getting an understanding of the cultures, because there's, there's what's called a cultural capital. There's an intellectual capital, there's an economic capital, and there's an importance to understand and appreciate the cultural capital to assess risks and to try to capture opportunities. And Tom is one of those great guys for inexpensively that is actually a true road warrior going to all of these places. Well, last year I spoke and had the opportunity of debating a very, very, very smart man on China. Um, the only difference is, is that for 10 years he's been saying China's going to collapse. Uh, he has been nothing but an advocate and paid by unions to turn around and push, uh, just like the unions have pushed for a lot of the radicals you've seen at those G20 meetings. Um, the G20 meetings of uh, when the finance ministers particularly get together, what people don't realize is that it's really not about trade, it's about taxation. It's about global taxation, however the unions believe it's about outsourcing jobs. Uh, and this is something that's important to recognize the form over the substance of what's taking place. I hope in this presentation today is to give you, what is the headline says, some more sunshine and less stormy weather. But nothing is straight line and nothing is perfect and we like to deal in probabilities as many of my presentations have shown. What is the probability? Why do I love this game? What is different than this in going to Vegas? In Vegas, you can't count the cards and if you do, you get beaten up. In this game, you can count the probabilities, what is the volatility of any, any commodity, any asset class. You can do it over rolling periods. You can actually simply on, on Excel sheets create what is the probability of a market or an asset class going plus or minus 10% over 20 trading days, over 60 trading days. These are the things that we do and try to understand what are the emotions and the factors that, that are driving that in addition to what Tom has been doing is going out and visiting these countries and embracing the differences of our culture and our values and looking for those opportunities. So in the past, the past 10 years or past 12 years, we've won many awards for our presentations, in particular our website. I highly recommend, how many here are subscribers to the Investor Alert? Great, excellent. Our Investor Alert is written by our investment team from going on the road from models, from when they, what they do is they look at three factors that help their performance or hurt their performance in the past week, and they try to project for the next week what factors could have an impact on their portfolio. Why is this important? Because last year I commented on recent research at MIT, and just I commented last week on Science Magazine, talked about the psychology of people, unhappiness. And so often happiness is defined what happened last week and is projected next week. So if last week was a bad week, then it has to be a bad week next week. And if last year was a bad year, then next year has to be a bad year. And in this research from teenagers to, to retired adults, there's this phenomenon of what they call anchoring, psychological anchoring impacts. Impacts your emotional decisions, which impact your economic decisions. And I'm gonna show you in this presentation some of, the, some of the most important parts of investing is follow the money. Follow the money. Is the money being opened up or is the money being restricted? If the money is being opened up by government policies, then you want to be going into that asset class. However, most of the talking heads and most of the politicians that are on television will do everything to talk about the negative. But there are opportunities. In San Antonio, we have a little company called Rackspace. Rackspace has only gone from $7 to $72 in the past four years. And what does it do? It's in the cloud space, which is a phenomenon in technology. And the same thing has happened when you take a look at other great stocks in these past four years, like Franco Nevada. 
which has had a 30% compounder rate of return. There are opportunities in what they have shown with research that if you do not have a positive attitude, like Viktor Frankl, the person, the significant writer and psychologist who lived through Auschwitz and commented that there were survivors, those who gave up in those concentration camps, and there were those who survived. What was the psychological makeup? Yes, reality, you have to deal with it, but you have to have a positive attitude because if you don't, you won't capture opportunities. And that's what's important, and that's what we try to highlight in our presentations. If you have an iPhone, iPad, a Blackberry, an Android, you can download our application so you can get our research, which comes out every week. And we're really ha truly happy this past year in our challenging market, we won something like 15 awards competing against the vanguards, the fidelities of the world in education. At U.S. Global, education is very significant to try to help ourselves, in addition to helping investors appreciate and understand what's taking place. And along with that is, is fund performance. We have won 29 awards for Lipper, and in fact, for the past decade, we still have many of our funds in the top 2% of all fund asset classes in the nation. So what gives you alpha? What gives you that performance like an athlete? There's two things when it comes to making money in markets. It's A, was it a good selection? And B, did you have the confidence to have a big enough weighting? Or, in the worst part, is if you had a bad selection and you were overweight. This is what wealth destruction is about. The other important concept in this presentation is to understand the metaphor of tipping points. Just think of water. H2O is like money. H2O goes from ice to water to gas, but it's still H2O. Money goes through tipping points, transition points, where it changes. And once you understand that at these tipping points, it's one degree difference creates a tipping point. And the same thing happens in markets with a junior company that has a, a, a spectacular discovery. It can ha be that tipping point. It's important for investors to understand what is the temperature that would drive a tipping point. For a gold mining company today, they have to have a high grade because all the disasters have been low grade. Only in the past five years, the average producer has gone from, from two grams of gold to one gram of gold. So those companies that turn around and find eight or ten grams of gold, they're the ones that capture the attraction, the attention. It's understanding what that tipping point is and understanding why, which gives you a competitive advantage. And when you're looking at demographics and looking at for the big shifts in the world, is understanding the shift of population. And I commented on this before, on the shift from people moving from rural areas to city centers took place in 1978, when there was great luck in the world, it was the Deng Xiaoping that took over China, not a Chavez. There was a combination of luck and a demographic switch, and all of a sudden unfolded intelligent, rational government policies that had the most, I think, spectacular growth of any economy in the history of mankind, has been China for the past 30 years. So when it comes to the rise of the middle class, we've not gone through that halfway mark. We have not gone through it. We are still, and when it goes, it takes off in a spectacular fashion. Did you know that BMW sales were up 40% in China last year and, and everything was negative about China? BMW sales, Land Rover sales, uh, I can give you all the luxury goods in a slow economy. What happens when the GDP of China starts to accelerate again? So it's for simplicity at U.S. Global, we like to look at government policies as a precursor to change. Outside of weather or acts of war, these government policies are important because they basically constrict money or they unleash money. And the biggest tax break for economic development is deregulation or streamlining, streamlining regulations. And I'm going to give you some case studies of this in this presentation. By the way, this presentation is on our website at usfunds.com, and I believe in everyone's chair you can sign up for the investor alert. Uh, and uh, send it in and we'll let you get you signed up for it. But government policies bifurcate. It's either monetary or it's fiscal. Who's in charge of the fiscal? It's usually the president or the prime minister of the country. Who's in charge of the monetary? It's the central bank. What does the central bank do? It also is simple, it bifurcates. And the same thing with fiscal policy. It's easy, tax and spend. Tax and spend for corporations and governments or tax and spend on individuals. So what we do at U.S. Global is compare the seven most populated countries in the world with the biggest economies of the world, the G7 countries. And what you see is the inverse relationship.
that basically 50 percent of the world's population is generating only about 22 percent of economic activity. It flips. But what we found recently in our research this past year is that the S&P 500, which is making all-time highs, is 15 percent weighted in energy and basic materials. And when we go through and look at $11 trillion of mutual fund assets, investors might have 2 percent invested in natural resources. In fact, last year, some of the biggest redemptions in equities were in natural resources. Even though the returns and the dividends are higher than the overall S&P 500, there's this immense negativity associated with that China's going to fall off the world. It's not going to happen. And yes, China's got issues, and yes, there's fraud, and yes, there's pollution, but the government policies there are about creating a positive change because there's, everything in China is based on two pillars, social st stability and economic independence. And there's always a fine-tuning that takes place in a complex world. So for investors, I believe this year you're going to see a rotation take place that's going to start coming back into natural resources, and we've seen this in the past two months. Now our resource fund, which I commented on earlier when I, when I had a debate last year with a, a gentleman that, that doesn't invest. And one of the other reasons why I show you this presentation with this slide is there's so huge flows going into ETFs. ETFs are shifting the formation of capital. What's the biggest uh, gold fund in America today is called GDXJ. And it has all the junior and emerging producers. And if your company is not invested or stock that you like is not in that, all of a sudden it can become orphaned. Investors in America and brokers cannot recommend a gold stock unless they have a gold analyst, all because of regulations. But they can recommend any ETF. So you're seeing this phenomenon take place where they'll just buy an ETF. And if a stock is not in the ETF, then the stock can easily become orphaned unless it's taken over. And or you have someone like a Tom Calandra covering it. And what we have found is the opportunity is that we try to find those stocks that are least expensive. So one of our biggest holdings, which we own over 15% of the company, is Grand Columbia. Why do we own a company like that? And it's been challenging and difficult. But Grand Columbia trades at less than $10 per ounce of gold in the ground, and the GDXJ trades at over 100 And the most recent gold acquisition was done at $150 of ounce of gold in the ground reserves. And the valuation for the production of an ounce of gold pushes more like $5,000 per ounce of gold production, and Grand Columbia is substantially cheaper than that. When they do get their act together of execute, otherwise the market executes you, when they do, and I believe this will take place this year, then you'll get a re-rating. So the stock is extremely undervalued. The warrants did go to, did go to a, an astronomical price, and that was the reason for a fund in, in Toronto that blew up called Flatiron. They had some quant model that was out buying the heck of those warrants, and I'm really happy to share with all of you, we sold every warrant we had. We couldn't believe what a windfall that was. We got those warrants for a penny in the financing, and all of a sudden they're at 17 cents. We sold them, we could turn around and buy the stock at 32 cents. Another phenomenon on this GDXJ is when it rebalances. Investors have to be very careful if you're in the resource sector, once a quarter they rebalance. They rebalance just before quarter end. And Grand Columbia, for a classic example, and BD Gold, etc., on that day, were rising because the price of gold was rising. And two minutes later, all of a sudden, Grand Columbia, for argument's sake, was 38 cents, is 32 cents. And millions of shares were sold. And if, you, if we weren't there to buy them, then all of a sudden they went into the broker's hands, who put it in their capital, and then they used computerized trading to keep selling the stock to millions of shares in a whole slew of these companies. This happens every quarter on this rebalancing. So the world has shifted and changed for investors to recognize what are those factors and how do you participate in it. I love this visual. Warren Buffett doesn't like gold, but it's outperformed Berkshire Hathaway, which is a great company and has done a remarkable job. Gold is an important asset class. Because last May when I was on CNBC, I was getting attacked by a, a writer, and it's amazing to see that the price of gold has rebounded from there, even as recent correction. But I walked through that this time last year, that Groupon and Facebook had lost more money than all the gold and all the gold funds in the GLD. These two stocks had lost investors more money than all the billions of dollars that's in the GLD. And I just find it distorted, and this is your opportunity as investors. So stop! As Daffy tells you, stop being a Daffy person. The stock market is up 72%. Gold is up, as you can see here, 82%. But everyone is redeeming. Look at these colorful characters. Let's look at this visual. 
in the past four years, and I wrote about this in March of 09. You go back on our website and you can see it. Government policies have changed. Obama's injecting $700 billion into the economy, predominantly going to unionize jobs to protect jobs. And then along comes QE1, 2, and 3. The amount of money going into the system defies the laws of gravity, but all those negative talking heads, if you watch CNBC and Bloomberg today, they have more politicians than they have money managers speaking. And you can't win. You, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you watch these debates, you still both walk away feeling sad. But if you go to a sporting event, half of the fans are happy and half the fans are sad. At least someone feels like a winner. But you watch these talking heads, you still feel like a loser and they're redeeming. The stock market's up 72%. How many here feel good about the rise of the stock market? Nobody. How many people feel good about their golds up 82%? Only two, three, four, five, six, seven people. Can you believe that? You missed it. And they're gonna continue to print the money. In the US, federal government workers in the past four years, that only 12% made more than $100,000. Today, 22% make more than $100,000. And they want regulations. The SEC is, is unionized. The Federal Reserve is unionized. And they want regulations and rules, et cetera, because it basically creates a job for them. And they're the dynamics, but they know they have to print the money to create the jo jobs to get elected. And when you take a look at bonds, everyone's running to put in bonds. This is a visual showing how low bonds have fallen. But this, even year to date, Money's going into these ETFs, or they're going into emerging market ETFs. They're not going into active managers to the degree that they haven't before. Even Vanguard last year had a record year, but active managers were sell redemptions, the ETFs. And I can show you that the Asian ETFs for the past month have been trading at a premium every day. You could buy at a discount an actively managed um, uh, China uh, fund, but if you went and bought a China ETF fund or a Vietnamese e ETF fund, you had to pay a premium every day. And if there's a redemption that's taking place in those ETFs, the sway, then you pay a discount. So those ETFs are not all simple and easy, but they're all rolling into bonds at the worst time. Look at this person, he's crying. He's redeemed out of equity funds and he's been buying bond funds, which are the most expensive and high risk and the stock market's gone up 72%. What an idiot. What an idiot, he's bought bonds which are up 20% and even gold stocks, which have been terrible for the past two years, have a positive move. Why, why has this market defied the laws of gravity? Follow the money. Follow the monetary economic base of the U.S. Follow the world. We have, we have been publishing these pieces for many years. Now, where's the bottom? That's all I ever hear, short term. Where's the bottom? The only place I'm good at calling tops and bottoms is South Beach. Not in the gold market except for one thing. Follow the money. What are people doing with their money? And understand the seasonality fluctuations that take place with gold and gold stocks. It's a very seasonal pattern. And when you take a look at the presidential election cycle, what is interesting is that during every presidential year, gold stocks suck. No pun intended. They underperform. Not only all funds last year had ne negative equity redemptions, but gold stocks in particular. But in the election year, after the election year, the post-election year, like this year we're in now, gold stocks historically outperform and they have an exaggerated move. So where are we on gold? As you can see here, we're oversold on a 12-month rolling basis. We love to use this mean reversion. It, everything always comes back to the mean. So gold has a probability of rising. But gold and silver don't move at the same time. So there's a different pattern in silver and at this time of the year can have a bigger move than gold. And that's an important factor. And then the other important factor investors to recognize for simplicity, approximately 50% of silver is industrial, industrial, and so if the world's GDPs are starting to rise again, guess what the demand for silver is going to be? Strong from industry. And the same thing happens with platinum. And if there are any strikes or any delays or disappointments in production coming on stream, silver ETFs, et cetera, rise dramatically. And then we're seeing that in silver coins. So there's more sunshine. And I'm not going to eliminate for you that there's going to be some stormy weather because the stormy weather coming up is going to be the debt ceiling and everyone's gonna panic and get out of it. And when push comes to shove, they're gonna just print the money. 
That's what's going to take place. And this visual here is to show you that every time there's been a ma major amount of monetary expansion, what happens to emerging markets? As you can see, the light green leads to a darker color, and that's the outer performance. First, money goes into, gas goes into the engine, then you turn the engine on, and you slowly get driving it, and it picks up speed. That's what's taking place for the past six months in emerging markets. And it's now everywhere in the world. They're all printing money. And it has a huge significance since October 21st. We've seen a huge turn when I wrote a piece on China coming back from Singapore. And little facts I didn't realize is that the average car in America has been on the road for 11 years. The miles per gallon is very low. The new cars have miles per gallon which are much greater. So the fact is that in 11 years, energy prices are higher. You have to turn around and get a new car to get better mileage per gallon. And financing is the cheapest it's been in the history of these cars. So what are we seeing right now? Car sales taking off. Car sales up 30%, 40%. There's a huge change taking place and therefore they need metals. But look at this, look at all these governments. Look at the simplicity of these flags. Look at the monetary expansion. Follow the money not the negative talking heads. And what happened last year, which drove the stock market to all-time highs, were buybacks. Even though there was $140 billion of equity redemptions, there was $240 billion of companies buying back their stock. They're not hiring because they don't know how to manage all the regulations which are, are, are excessive. Lots of good ideas, but the law of unexpected consequences take place. So what are they doing with their capital? They're buying back their companies. Even BlackRock, which is just the biggest, uh, owns iShares, just recently announced last week a $1.6 billion buyback of their stock. So this year, there's a transition thought process that people are gonna start leaving bonds, going into equities. I went my presentation a year ago was that dividend paying stocks offer a better yield than any government paper. Five or 10 year paper. And this is a historical event that's taken place in the past 100 years. It's only happened one other time. So money flows into Asian emerging markets have taken off again. And then this is a presentation I wrote in October. You can go visit the website saying how cheap Chinese stocks were relative to the world. And all I would get back was, yes, but it's all bad accounting. It's not all bad accounting. Yes, there are bad accounting. In every country, there's always crooks, just like there are bad drivers on the road. And just like there's people that drink and drive, there's, that's just, just life. But not everyone is a, is a drunk on the road, and not everyone is a crook and a criminal. So there are great valuation opportunities. And I, in that presentation, I said that China has gone for the fourth year being in the bottom half of all emerging market countries, and the odds favor for mean reversion. I didn't expect it to happen all within two months. And the other part I was trying to show you here, money supply, follow the money. It had turned positive. And this is looking at U.S. consumers. U.S. consumers, better than the government, have tightened their belt. They've actually cut back in their spending. They've been paying down bank debt. It's unbelievable. And they've also been refinancing the houses at a huge mortgage refinancing at lower rates and using that to pay down their credit cards. So America, as, a, as, as investors, retail investors, are in healthier shape than they were in the past 10 years. And there's consumer conquer, conquering debt. And then we took a look at equities. They still remain, even with the big rally, relatively attractive on a historical basis. And when you look at the G7 countries, when you take a look at inflation, everything's in check. And when you look at emerging markets, the E7 countries, and what are you seeing on these visuals? You're seeing that the, that the debt of governments in emerging markets in the middle slide is substantially lower than the G7 countries. So they have the capacity to reflate their economies. And emerging markets, even though they've started a great rise, are still undervalued on a historical basis. And the other part of showing you government policies is that there's no room for fiscal stimulus in Europe with the governments. That's the whole idea of tightening their belt. So you know what they recently did? Because this was a headwind two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, this was a headwind. The banks in Europe had to raise more capital under Basel III to provide loans but this was going to become a fiscal drag. So what do you think the government did? They changed the rules. They say you don't have to raise this amount of capital and yes, go ahead and start spending money and lending money. And why is this important for commodities? Because the letters of credit for commodities, the greatest amount of letters of credit for commodities are from European banks. 
A lot of financing that takes place in Latin America and Africa comes from European banks. If you go to Indaba in South Africa, you'll see that it'll all be European banks that are there because they're doing the mining finance, not North American banks. So there's a fiscal stimulus that's taking place right now, right now, last week it started, and there's the monetary policy that is basically forcing rates, manipulating interest rates, never mind manipulating gold, they're manipulating interest rates at all time low to refinance themselves. Poland, which was a spectacular performer last year, Turkey was up 70%, Poland was up 40%, they're rolling over their debt at half the rate. Uh, there's tremendous opportunities in that stock market. And there's a price reversal that will take place in China, and China's record oil demand is not stopping. And housing in the U.S., it's turned. Housing is turned, but you wouldn't think so unless you looked at the housing stocks. And what is the significance for steel? And now rebar has almost doubled in the past three months. So that's positive for steel. And if you take a look at here showing you the price spot for uh, rebar, everything's turned up. And the motion to buy cars that are electric, totally electric, well, they need so much more copper. There's no free lunch on the periodic table. If they try to force everything to go electric, then all of a sudden you're going to need copper. Then you want to go run out and buy copper stocks. And now the government in Washington, just south of the border, is going to start taxing these electric cars because they need to get taxes for the roads. Because usually the U.S. government, the state governments, tax you on the gas consumption to pay for the road construction. That's the A to B mechanism. But if everyone's driving electric cars, then how are they going to tax you on the gas because you're using electricity, so now they're taxing electric cars. And uranium, uranium prices have tar are, are looking for a bottom here, so we think that there's great opportunity there. And gold demand. Let's quickly fast track this presentation. The gold has two factors. Think of it always 50-50 like silver. 50% 50 50 of the gold demand is the love trade, and 50% is the fear trade the fear of currencies being devalued. And what you're seeing now is something that's very significant as central banks are buying gold. As Pierre Lassan was commenting that emerging markets, for them to increase their consumption of gold, they'll have to buy 1,000 tons of gold, which is 40% of the world's mine supply, every year for the next 20 years to get up to 15%. What people don't realize is that in Europe, in the year 2000, the European banks said that banks should have 15, central banks should have 15% in gold. So we're now seeing these emerging countries diversifying to own gold. And this is showing you a simple gold chart. You can see the pr demand for central banks rising, and you see the price of gold rising. And the bullion ETF still remain at all-time highs. Now the love trade. What you're seeing is important with the love trade is GDP per capita that relates to religious holidays. 50% of the world's population give gold. They give gold for birthdays, for wedding anniversaries, for uh, uh, seasonal holidays. And the rising GDP per capita slowed down last year in, econ in emerging markets, as we all know from China, from 9.5 to 7.5. Well, that has an impact. But not as much for China as it did for India. Government policies came in to put a tax on the import of gold. So you saw Chinese, sorry, Indian imports drop by 30%. And that's why gold didn't go through the $2,000 level. And that's reversed because all the jewelers in India started going on strike. And so there was a reversal, and all of a sudden, now you see these differences taking place. So it's important to understand the GDP per capita. And you can see where China relates has still got a long way to go. And gold stocks have been also deplorable for the past couple of years. But over the past four years, they've still outperformed bonds. And this is a classic example showing you bullion, gold stocks, and bonds. But what have investors been doing? They've been running and buying bonds because of this psychological phenomena of remembering 2008. Remember this, check yourself, pinch yourself, slap yourself. What happened yesterday doesn't mean it's going to happen today. What happened last week doesn't mean it's going to happen next week. Because this is a phenomenon that all human beings have, that if something was, was bad last week, they project it and carry it forward. So 2008 gets carried forward. It gets carried forward by consumers, also regulators. The regulators are just so intense, and they have good intentions, but the law of unexpected consequences are the formation of capital model changes. It changes. And as investors understand that, and who's taking the advances, all this high tech and flash trading, et cetera. So you have to try to understand, like I mentioned, do not do any trading four times a year when you have the GDXJ rebalancing. If you're buying junior gold stocks, just be careful, because the volatility is wild. 
Show me the money for these gold producers. Most of the companies here are explorers. The gold producers need to be spanked because all they've done is turn around and get stock options on the beta of gold. Gold's down, they have a board meeting, they issue stock options, and then gold goes up, they turn around and sell the stock options, and they come and see me, and I should buy their gold, their gold company. It's deplorable, and I'm gonna show you what's taking place, is that they turn around and make promises that are not being able to fulfill. This is a key factor based on studies done by CIBC of looking at their forecasts and exactly what they deliver. So if they say they're gonna deliver you 12% growth, expect mine is eight. So if that's what life is all about, manage the expectations, then understand it. If they say they're gonna grow at 25%, they're not, they're gonna grow at 10. So you have to make sure you don't overpay for that growth. And this is another visual showing you what, what really, we've tracked 80 gold producers in the world. And what we have seen in the past four years is that gold supply from these 80 gold producers is up 14%. But the gold production per share is minus 9%. Why is that? because these characters are issuing stock options faster than they're increasing production. That's why gold stocks don't give you the leverage in a rising market. You don't have to assume when you buy a GLD, you don't have to assume the political risk, the technical risk, etc. And at the same time, you don't have to look at the dilution. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. But these characters have been printing money like governments have been printing money. So it's important to recognize that I think there's a shift taking place. Another factor we've been writing about and we're happy to see that gold mining companies are giving their all-in costs. They used to be so silly of saying, our cash cost is, or cash cost is only $600, our cash cost is only $500. Do you, do they, are they stupid to think that governments in Colombia don't read those reports? Immediately, the unions in Colombia or Argentina or, the, or South Africa, they say, if your cash costs are so low, you're stealing our resources, we want to tax you more. So cash costs have gone up, cash taxes have gone up faster than the price of gold. So the grade has been falling and costs have been going up. So these are all key factors that people have to understand on taxes, all these factors have impacted gold mining companies and they've not been paying dividends. The overall cost for producing an ounce of gold is between $1,500 and $1,700. Do not listen to cash costs, it's, it's la la land. And discoveries, that's why we're here to look at these companies. Hopefully they can have a discovery that changed the landscape because in the past few years there's been no three million ounce discoveries of high grade gold. It's all low grade, high risk, high risk countries. So mother nature is making it more and more difficult unless there's a technological breakthrough like they had for oil and gas and fracking. And I think there's also important for gold mining companies to take place with Nick Holland, the CEO of Goldfields, started commenting the leadership wasn't you as complaining as an investor or me as a money manager because I go from being fabulous Frankie when I give them money and then I'm, oh, I'm cranky Frankie because I'm complaining about what they're doing with the company. It is now we're getting some leadership with CEOs recognizing this. And he has said that these gold mining companies have not leveraged themselves intelligently. They've not shown the value of the production per share and they've not paid you dividends. Well, what have we seen last year? A huge number, a huge percentage increases in dividends being paid by gold mining stocks, but they're still behind the S&P 500. So margin compression is taking place in previous cycles, but for all you investors here to recognize the life cycle of a mine, because this is predominantly like a high tech, new technology, this is a new resource, looking for exploration, developing new assets, and it's truly important to understand where you are in the life cycle of a mine. And my good friend Tom Calandra, I do not have 1,500 people working at US Global. I uh, wish I was that big, and this is created by a very small group of, uh, of people that are in a research department. And this is the last visual to give you. This is to show you to replace the nine million ounces is basically spending $9 billion is $100 per ounce of gold. So when you look at these juniors, you want to be assured that they're finding gold substantially less than $100 per ounce. Because you can buy gold mining companies that do not have that risk. And money, many of these companies that are finding gold is around $30 an ounce. And once they've proven it and they're in production, they get a rating in the GDXJ of over $100 an ounce. So be very important that you ask this question when you're talking to these juniors. And here's gold, one, two, three, 
See this? One, two, three, up, down. One, two, three, up, down. There's a pattern taking place. Against all the commodities, gold is never the best performing asset class every year. I have written about this. I advocate only a 5% in bullion and 5% in gold stocks and rebalance each year to appreciate, to, to capture these opportunities and recognize what's taking place. And the last is I end up this presentation. Do not get caught up with the talking negative heads or someone that's, a, that's so bullish on their stock or their story. Markets go through a true DNA of volatility. What I'm trying to show you here is the 12-month rolling volatility of gold, or, and you can see that gold is less than the S&P 500. The gold, anytime it's up 26%, that's two times 13%, there's a 95% probability of a correction. Anytime it's down 13% over 12 months, there's a 70% probability of a rise. If it's down 26%, there's a 90% probability of a rise. So this I love about looking at asset classes that you can do the math and count. And gold stocks just have more volatility. So if gold stocks are up 30%, that's a normal volatility. But if they're up 70%, look to take some profits. And another way to look at that is how often they go plus or minus 10%. And this is a visual to show you that gold stocks versus billion, they, so often that they will move much more dramatically, more often plus or minus 10%. It's the DNA of volatility, and once you appreciate this sheet, memorize it if you trade these stocks. Memorize it so therefore you can understand your emotions, and they don't get too negative. And hold on to this, your gold stocks, because if gold gets rebalanced at the way they're printing money, we're talking about $7,000. And for all the hard money assets in here, if you looked at the true monetary aggregate to, towards gold, you're pushing $50,000 an ounce. I don't think gold gets re-rated at $50,000 an ounce, but it'd be very easy for the governments on the next big push is to turn around and create a new rating, and the U.S. government, everyone would look beautiful if they re-rated gold at $7,000 an ounce. So they could say, last year was a bad season, clean the balance sheet, let's all start it over again. And that is what took place, basically, the thought process through the 30s, can that happen again? So remember, investors, as I end this presentation, to be thankful that you're here today. You woke up. As many people in Vancouver didn't wake up. People have had car accidents today. You didn't, you're here. Be thankful. And once you're thankful, you are thoughtful. And once you are thoughtful and you have gratitude, you then can better see opportunities. As Viktor Frankl said in his, his breakthrough research that was written 30 years ago, it hasn't gone away. Do not get caught up with the negative talking heads, Democrats versus Republicans. Follow the money. Be thankful of your family, your children, the people beside you, and capture those opportunities. And thank you for your patience. I have overextended my time. Happy investing.